it is a blessing to be with you today and opening up God's Word. I'm going to give you a couple minutes as I introduce Haggai for you to find Haggai. It's at the end of your Old Testament, toward the end. And um, we're going to spend a couple of weeks in Haggai. Uh, there's some wonderful stuff in here. I have uh, so enjoyed my study this last springtime, starting in January and such, um, spending some time studying the minor prophets and then teaching that on, on Wednesdays to our adult Bible study. I, uh, I would say it's probably a, uh, a neglected portion of Scripture, what we call the minor prophets, and I'm not sure why that needs to be. It seems to be, but uh, even in my own life, I'll admit, personally, I, I have never studied the minor prophets in, in any, any depth, in any uh, uh, more than superficial way. I, I've read them, but uh, it's been, it's been a, an advantage of mine. It's been a blessing for me to, to enjoy, and, I mean, to be studying them. And why, why are they called the minor prophets? Um, maybe that in and of itself, go, ah, they're minor. Uh, yeah, they're minor, but they're not minor because they don't count. <laughs> they're minor because they're short for the most part, all right? The major prophets would be the, the lengthier books of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And so those are the major prophets, and these others are minor. And some of them are very small. Um, Haggai is but two chapters. It's only 38 verses, and so it's, there's not a lot of information there, but uh, it is really good. And as I've been going through them, I'm saying, I just said to myself, I, I think I want to teach Haggai. Just we're only going to do a couple of weeks. Um, and so uh, I would encourage you, even in the next two and three weeks, read Haggai a couple of times. It'll take you six minutes. And then maybe some other day, you've got another six minutes somewhere in your schedule that you could read it again. And then you're, you've read the whole book two times. That'd be, I'd encourage you to do that, all right? Um, it is, though, a uh, kind of a, this section, Haggai itself, a, a neglected section. Um, personally, I, I do enjoy studying the New Testament more for whatever reason. At least I do it more than the Old Testament. I think it's probably because I'm biased. I live in the New Testament age, the church age, that when the promises have been fulfilled of what the Old Testament was talking about, our Lord has come, He has died, He has resurrected, and let's get on with the church. Let's get on with the next phase of God's plan. And, and all of that is good, and it's, it's, it's exciting as well. But the Old Testament is powerful. Um, it, it, has, it has set the stage for what will be true in the New Testament. And so we're going to spend a bit of time here. Um, in, in reading Haggai and the other minor prophets, I, I could have guessed what the information might have been about. So I, I really wasn't surprised by its richness, these minor prophets, by the wisdom that comes out of them, by the benefits that are there for us to, to, to grapple with, to enjoy, to pull out the timelessness of them. That's why I think Haggai, though it was written in a specific time for particular people on a specific issue, it, it's, very, it's very specific. What he said to them, what God said through Haggai to the people that he was ministering to, it's for us. The thoughts, the concepts are for us. Not the exact interpretation, because we weren't living then. But the concepts, I think, are for us as well. I would remind you, as, a, as we read through the Old Testament and now are blessed to be New Testament saints, that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's doing what He chooses to do. And He is just, meaning He will exactly render what is due. Whatever is exactly required, God is exactly going to cause that to be true. And at times, that can be a great hope and joy and celebration for us. God is just. It's going to happen, as he said, exactly in the rendering of what is right and what is good. But along with that, understand that he is also just in the rendering of judgment or punishment, as we sometimes say. God is a just God. That cannot be missed as you read the Old Testament. As we read the Old Testament also, God is working out His plan. It's His plan. 
you would be wise to get in line with his plan because it's going forward. Not your plan, unless your plan is also his plan. And this plan that God has is for all peoples. He used a particular people, the Jews, the seed of Abraham, a particular people to work out this plan. But this plan is for all people. There is only one God. May I say that again? There is only one God. And because there is only one God, there is only one way to him. And he's laid that out, and he's done a masterful job throughout history of convincing us, giving us evidence and reasons to believe what it is that we believe. Haggai is going to present to us a, a group of people that needed to hear a message. I'm going to give you a little history lesson about this just to set up the, the, the teaching itself. But um, the reason we can benefit from it is because, well, we're like them, these people that are going to be mentioned here. Humans are fickle. We are just uh, all over the place. We want what we want. At times, we're kind of foolish. You might agree with that as well. We are hard-headed. Have you ever noticed that about the people you live with? They are so hard-headed. I know, it's crazy. It's just weird how that works out. But in the midst of all that, God communicates his will. He has made it clear. And uh, our problem is, is that we fail to do this. We fail to do what he would have us to do, to live the way he would call us to live. And so God is faithful. He calls us back. And that's what the prophets were doing thousands of years ago. 3,000 years ago, give or take a couple of decades, all right? 3,000 years ago, King David was on his throne in Jerusalem. His son Solomon followed. The Jewish people, because of their selfishness, soon after that, they, there was a split of the kingdom, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And they lived for some 200 years in the northern kingdom under 22 different kings. One after another, some 200 and more years, 22 kings. You might wonder how many of those kings of God's people in the northern kingdom of Israel, how many of them were righteous, would be said to have followed the ways of the Lord, followed after their father, David, who was a man after God's own heart? How many of those 22 northern kings? Zero. And in the midst of all of this time, God was faithful. He sent prophets. That's when you read about some of the, the prophets of Nahum and Isaiah. The, these prophets who are saying to the people, stop what you are doing. They had a, a typical message that they would give. They would speak of the warning that is coming if you don't repent, calling them to repentance. But they wouldn't repent. They didn't repent. And then those prophets speak of judgment. It's coming. It's going to be intense. And the judgment came, but in those prophecies as well, God was faithful. He says, but I'm going to restore. I will restore. In the northern kingdom, in the midst of these prophets that came, the ones we know about, the ones that we don't know about, the ones that are unnamed, the people did not turn. And so God judged the northern kingdom. The year 722 before Christ, before the common era, right? So we're going back 2,700 years ago. The kingdom of Assyria took the northern kingdom of Israel off to captivity, never to be returned to the land. The land, the land they fought for, their gener that their forefathers had fought for, the land that God had promised them, the promised land. They were taken off the land, never to return as those tribes to that land. The southern kingdom also, oddly, had 22 kings that uh, ruled them from the time of Solomon in the kingdom split until their last king. They had 22 also. How many of them were righteous kings, were said to have been following after the ways of the Lord, their father David? How many? 
seven. And God was gracious, probably to those kings and to the the people who repented during those times. 150 years later, though, they also, God had had enough. He said, judgment is coming. And in the year 586, the third of three exiles to Babylon took place. 586, and the temple was ruined. The city of Jerusalem was was ransacked. It was destroyed. You can imagine being the people of God during this time. God said he was going to do it, and he did it. That's just a little history lesson. Again, we, we humans, we're foolish. We don't heed when we could or when we should. And what did they do to these prophets as these prophets were pronouncing the the ways of God, calling people back to repentance? The scriptures are clear, and it's not a pretty picture. Let me read a couple verses for you from Nehemiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, speaking of prophets, and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. This is Nehemiah after the exiles have concluded. Nehemiah will be one of the leaders who will bring a remnant back to Jerusalem. That's the history. That's where Nehemiah fits. All right? The exiles have happened, and Nehemiah is bringing people back, and he's giving them a little history lesson. Here's what happened. He's going to call them to faithfulness. Don't commit these blasphemies. That's what Nehemiah had to say. Paul speaks of the prophet Elijah in Romans 11, where Paul, quoting Elijah, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. This is Elijah, the great prophet Elijah. The people killed the prophets. Stephen, when he is giving his last (laughs) testimony, about the work of God in the affairs of man, soon after his speech, he will be stoned. In that speech, he said this, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. The people didn't like hearing it, but it was true. The prophets had been killed. Jesus, the Messiah, by Stephen's testimony, has been killed. First Thessalonians, Paul reminds the Thessalonians, he says, the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind. Again, are you noticing this idea what they've done to the prophets? The prophets have spoken and the people have said, no, we don't want to hear that. There are more verses like this. You can read the stories about it. Read Hebrews about some of the things, Hebrews chapter 11, some of the things that happened to the prophets, the people that are bringing God's word, God's call. A question we can ask right now, we think of those people and what they did, and we say, oh, shame, shame. Oh, bad people. Oh, they shouldn't have done that. They should listen to God's prophets. How do you respond to God's call? How do you respond to God's reminder, his voice, his word to you? How do you respond when you read it? Does it change you? Do you say, ah, I don't want to hear that? The Old Testament speaks of the Israelites' refusal to repent and to change. And so devastation came to them. They were removed from the land. Horrible in their mind. And that brings us now to Haggai. Where does Haggai fit? Well, he is a contemporary to Nehemiah. He's a part of the group that has returned back to the promised land, to Jerusalem. And they're going to rebuild the city walls, and they're going to rebuild the temple, and they're going to reestablish themselves in that piece of of land, again, in in faithfulness, in God's faithfulness to say, I know what I've done, but I'm going to bring you back. And they have. They've come back. This restoration is, it has come. And Haggai is writing nearly seven, after nearly 70 years of exile. 
a whole generation and more had gone and many of them have died. It's been 70 years. Children are now old folks returning to Jerusalem. Their children who were born in Babylon are now coming back. Maybe grandchildren already are now coming back. It's been 70 years. And they have returned to the land, to the city. This is the, the time period. is 536. The history, in the history of, this, of, of these events are found in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? And the prophets that are a part of this time period are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Right? So that's where Haggai fits. The people have returned. Some, not all. Some have returned. And this time, the hope is, is that it will be different. And they are. As Haggai is going to speak, we're going to find out that they are listening, and they are changing, and they are not going to be like their great-grandparents were, and like the great, 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 great hundreds of years of grandparents who didn't repent and turn to the Lord. These people, when Haggai says something to them, I am so happy to report they listened, they considered, and they changed their ways. This is a wonderful story to relate to, but they too needed to be spoken to, right? So that's what we're going to take a look at as we go through this, the message of Haggai. I believe in, these, in just 38 verses, but I believe that there are some nuggets of truth for us to consider. Really good ones. And why is this? Because we are like them. When we read Haggai, we're going to go, oh, I think I know what that means. I think I get that idea. I, it, it's not hard because we're humans. We are like them. We are attempting to make our way we are attempting to live this life that is in front of us. We try to do what is best. We try to figure out what is good. We try to make our way. We are hopeful for the future. We're awaiting the blessed words that all Christians are just, mm, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 21 speaks of that. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Just read that verse again. Can't you just wait? Is it not going to be glorious? Well done. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh, this is great. And that's what we think about. And that's who we are. And so here we are on this planet, doing our thing, making our way. And I want to show you a wonderful verse in Haggai. Even, even as we start, I'm setting up a really good situation here, but just read with me chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Two wonderful things in that, what the people did. They obeyed and they feared the Lord. This is wonderful news. Again, but that's verse 12. What are they obeying? Why have they come to a new fear? What has been spoken? What have they been challenged with that brings them to this situation? For our purposes, as I'm looking at this, at this two-chapter book, we're going to view Haggai overall message as four timely reminders. We're going to cover the first one today. But there are going to be four timely reminders that as we read Haggai, we're going, oh, I need to hear that one. Just four. How many reminders could you have from the Word of God? Hundreds. But these four that Haggai brings are pretty powerful, pretty good. I like them. And I'm going to be, I'm pleased to share them with you in this way. In many aspects, this people, Haggai's people, are starting anew. They're starting over. Their world, some of them weren't even born, but the old folks who were children of the exile have now returned as grandparents, as elders, and they're starting anew. The world, their world had been destroyed, and here they come, 
and they're going to be blessed in a very specific way. And their successes are going to be tied to four reminders. If they will do these four things, it's going to go well for them. And I think we're going to see that they did. So what are these four reminders today? Just the first one. Number one is simply to say it in this manner. Hey, remember me? Who's saying that? God is. God is saying to this returned people, this remnant that's returned, he's saying, hey, remember me? Don't forget me. <laughs> Don't start that pattern again. Don't, oh, no, no, no. Wait, stop what you're doing. Do you remember me? How do we get there? Well, the setting is when this Haggai, when this prophecy comes to the people, through Haggai to the people, it has been 16 years since they first came back, right? That's a long time, 16 years. Is that enough time to establish yourself with a certain pattern, with a certain understanding, with a certain, this is how we do things now, 16 years of this? I think you'd say, oh yeah, that's enough time. And they have, they, they have returned and this first wave of exiles to Jerusalem, to Judah. And what they did when they immediately came back was, was phenomenal. And you can read about it in Ezra and Nehemiah. That's the history of this situation, right? Haggai has a word from the Lord, but Ezra and Nehemiah record what they did. And what they did, it's wonderful. They immediately got to, got to work. They got to work on the walls. And as, from Haggai's perspective here, they got to work on the temple itself. And they built the altar and they built the foundation of the temple right away. They immediately got to it. Well, why? Why did they immediately get to that? Well, because that is where they worship the Lord. That's where their religion has a sanctuary, has a place of worship, a place of sacrifice. They are Jews, and they have been in exile for 70 years, and they have had to adjust, change do away with some of the things that were in the Mosaic law that they were to do. They were to do it in the temple, but they don't have one. And they have kind of sort of done their best, and now they've come back, and they're going to build a temple. It's exciting for them. They got right to it. We're so proud of them. However, Ezra and Nehemiah will tell us that opposition came, the surrounding peoples that were there saying, no, 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 no. We don't want them to establish themselves here. I know they've been allowed back by the king. They've come back, but we don't want them here. We don't, we, we're looking for ways when we can get rid of them again or whatever. If they build that city, if they build that place of religious worship, oh, well, it's not going to be good for us. So the neighboring tribes, the neighboring peoples put up a lot of opposition, a lot of threats, a lot of warring rumors of war. We're going to do this. Gonna, and the people go, ah, 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 and they got scared. And they stopped. They had built some of the wall. They had built the altar. They had built some of the foundation of the temple. And then they just stopped. And they have said, well, it's because of them. The Samaritans, the, the Edomites, whatever, these neighboring peoples. And we're, we're a little bit scared. And now, as Haggai comes on the scene, they have now developed their own reasons too. Not just opposition. If it weren't for the opposition, we'd be doing it. No, it was the opposition that started the problem. But after year two, year five, year seven, year 10, year 12, here we are now in year 16, they've just gotten used to their own ways again. It's just become a pattern, a habit, and they are just doing their living life. They've forgotten about what they should have done. And God's saying, hey, remember me? Remember the temple? And Haggai has come. Let's read the first two verses here of the, of the prophecy. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So you've got a governor, you've got a high priest, here comes Haggai. He's timed it out. That's the date. That's the situation. And verse 2, in quotes, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. That's what these people are saying. Oh, not yet. Not yet. 
Now, it was the time of the Lord, apparently, when they got there 16 years ago to rebuild the house of the Lord. But now, oh, no, no, not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. When? Oh, I don't know. Like next year? Oh, can't say. It's hard to tell. Hmm, we'll have to, you know, check things out then as well. And on and on and on it's been going. And now it's a habit. It's just the way it is now. After 16 years, what's going to change? Whatever the reasons were, whatever their excuses are, God has noticed. And he has been patient. I would be willing to say in this circumstance, 16 years is a good bit of time that God has been patient. And now here comes Haggai to deliver a message. And what's his message? Brace yourselves. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Verse 4 says, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Time to dwell in your paneled houses? Really? That tells you that they're not just returned. This is 16 years later. What did they have when they returned? What did they come to? Nothing. Destruction, whatever. It's been 70 years. So when they show up, where, where are they living? Where are they dwelling? By the river? In a tent? Who knows? I mean, they brought all their belongings from Babylon. I mean, what do they have? But they've taken time, apparently, in these 16 years to care very well about themselves. They are living now in paneled houses. Those weren't there when they got there. No Zillow. Okay, that, that, that's not there. They have come and built it. And they've taken not just houses of stone, paneled houses, which speaks to a level of care and concern. May I say luxury and self-awareness self of what I want and what I'm going to do? God is telling them, my house is in ruins. And if my house, my temple, the place where I dwell is in ruins, then the sacrifices are not being done the way I told you to do them. The religion that I've given you, the law that I've given you, is passing away. Whatever you had been doing in Babylon to make do while you were in a pagan land, whatever adjustments you made have now just become permanent here. That's not what I intended. This is not why I brought you back. And you know that because when you got back, you started to build the temple. What's happened? What's going on? This is the place of sacrifice. And Haggai has a word for them. He is offering them a correction. Through Haggai, God is saying, hey, <laughs> what about me? You remember me? Your God? The God of your forefathers? The one who has done all of these things for you? What about me? This is a gentle rebuke. It could have been harsher, but it is a gentle rebuke to their complacency. To their just, it's all about here. It's all about now. I'm kind of liking it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And have you seen my house? Let's read on. Verse 5, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Hmm. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Is that a prophetic understanding of basically saying things aren't working out the way you thought they would, are they? And he goes on, he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There's a reason for this. This didn't just happen, just, I don't know, how did this happen? No, it, it's happening because you have chosen a certain path, a certain way, and he's now, they're being called to consider these ways. Take an honest look at your choices. Take an honest look at your priorities. And if you do, 
Haggai is saying, God is saying through Haggai, you'll come to the same conclusion I have. You'll realize what I already know, that we haven't done what God has called us to. What have we done? Consider your ways. God is calling them to this. As you read on into verse 8, it says, Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. That's the house, meaning the temple. Verse 9, You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Oh, <laughs> consider your ways. Because I... Said, it said there, I blew it away. I, God, have called for a drought. God did this to them. This wasn't, how did this happen? God did it. He's claiming it. That's me. I was the one. These 16 years, that's me. It's not what it could have been for you. I want to pour out blessings on you, but you're not doing what I've asked you to do. Your choices have had a consequence. I have withheld blessing. You apparently did not trust me enough to deal with the opposition that you did encounter when those neighboring peoples wanted to, you know, kind of deal with you a certain way and they were speaking against you and against the work and this and that and you got scared. You didn't trust me. The God of your fathers, the God who opened the Red Sea, I couldn't do that. The God who brought you into the land and drove people out in front of you. Apparently, you don't think I could handle this too? A couple months ago, a year ago, and more maybe, we came across this principle in Scripture, and I want to share it with you again. The principle is this. It's just a, just a quote. God will provide my needs to accomplish His will. Do you believe that? God will provide my needs to accomplish his will. If he's called me to do it, then he's going to provide for me to do it. I'm not going to, good luck. Hope it works out for you. The most powerful aspect of that that I can think of is the Holy Spirit, Christian. He's given you his Holy Spirit to dwell in you, in you, to accomplish what he has set for you to do. The question can be asked, why did God do this? Why did he blow it away? Why did he call for a drought? Why did he blow it away? Verse 9 told us, because my house lies in ruins. For 16 years now, my house has been lying in ruins. You've been going on with your own self, with your own ways, all of that, but um, our relationship has not been a priority to you. The blood sacrifices to be done on the altar, in the temple, eh, you're not doing that either. God is saying, remember me? God is mindful of his plan for the salvation of the world. We know the ending of it. We've seen it. We've, we worship Christ, our Savior on the cross, but that hasn't happened yet. But God knows that there are some things that must be true when Jesus comes on the scene. And part of that, God knows, deals with a temple. You can't cleanse the temple if there's no temple. There's some prophecies that have been put forth by the prophets hundreds of years ago. And we've got to get forward with this. We've got to be moving, and God is calling these people to change their ways. We have a plan to fulfill, and their choices are affecting that, even affecting it into the future. And the text speaks of here now three weeks of them to consider their ways. The next verse, verse 12, I've already read it for you. But again, it, it says on a particular day, here's what happened, is that three weeks later of considering and assessing and contemplating and praying and talking and getting together and wrestling with the challenge before them of consider your ways, 
We read in verse 13, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, (laughs) declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of Joshua and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Wow. God stirred up the spirit of these people. I'm with you, declares the Lord. Something's gone on these three weeks. The people have, I, I, I'd be willing to say, repented. Their hard-headedness, their selfishness, their concern for self above the plan of God was dealt with individually, and the people have had a, a glorious turning back to the Lord. Verse 12, we did, I read it again. Let's, let's look there. It says, Obey the voice of the Lord, and they feared the Lord, and the result now is, I am with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of them. Their inner man has been moved by God. This is phenomenal. What's the result of their spirit being moved by God? Well, we know that too. Verse 14, it goes on. And stirred up, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month. That's three weeks later from when they were called to consider their ways. So what happened? They came and worked on the house. Ezra, chapter 5, speaks of this. It's a wonderful time of celebration and confidence, and we're going to do this, and we're going to get after it, and yes, there's still opposition, but we're making progress. We're going to build the house of the Lord. And they continued on it. It didn't happen in a week. They didn't finish this temple in a week or a month or a year. It took five years when they then were able to say, we have accomplished it. We have done it. And may God be praised. May they be be blessed for what they have done in obedience. This is a blessed thing. They have done this. Took them five years. This temple that they built, and now it's the year 520, or 515, excuse me, the year 515, right? So they've been in the land for another 21 years. Now they have a temple, the year 515. At that time, that temple is the temple known as the second temple. Solomon's temple was the first. That got destroyed. Here now is the second temple, and it will stand. It will be of theirs for hundreds of years. Soon before the birth of Christ, the king of the region under Roman law, but the king was Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was known for building things. He was just an architect, an engineer, and he and his guys, I mean, tremendous resources were spent to build things. And they, they, Herod took upon the task of expanding and building out this particular temple. And this becomes the temple that Jesus was lived with, okay? And he began that soon before the birth of Christ, and it continued on through the life of Christ all the way until the year of uh, 66, possibly 67 in our common era. 83 years of expansion and building it out. Glorious place. It stood for three years. And in 70 AD, the Romans, because of the rebellion of the Jews in Jerusalem, the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem, conquered Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple again. And there is no temple today. A portion of it still exists. It's known as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. You can go visit it today. That now has, that's been there for 2,000 years now, okay? But it's not the temple. That's the temple that these people have now built. And that's a little bit of an understanding for them. As we conclude, what, what application can we make today? I'm wondering how many of you could right now come up and say, oh, I've got some applications. I think I know what the Lord is saying to us. I don't think it'd be that hard. I think this is as an easy an application as you can find in Scripture, that the Word of God was given to those people 2,500 years ago, and the concept still relates to us today. We're not building a temple. We're not, you know, doing the walls and all that kind of stuff. We're not in Jerusalem, I, I know. But what did he say to those people? What was the Word of the Lord through Haggai to those people? Let me ask you a first question. Do we have a temple to build, Christian? 
do we have a temple to build? Survey says, yes. Prove it. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. I'm my own. No, you're not. Slave of sin, slave of Christ. Pick. That's what the scriptures teach. I want to be my own. You don't get to be your own. Make yourself, then you get to be your own. How do you make myself? Right. Okay? So which is it going to be? Well, I choose Christ. Good. Then you're a slave of Christ. And your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. How is your temple building going? Should we consider our ways relative to our temple building? Hey, remember me? God says to us as well. How many ways do you have? How many things could you consider? Consider your ways. Oh, man. This will take a while. That's fine. Take the time you need. But soon and very soon, make a decision. Those people did three weeks. And they were, as a group of people, committed to the project. We're going to build this temple. God stirred their spirit within them to accomplish this. Well done. Good for them. How about you? How many ways do you have to consider? Is it possible? Here's another question. We kind of came across this in Haggai there in verse 9 through 11. Um, Is it possible that God has withheld blessing to you, to me, because of my, because of your selfish ways? Is it possible that what happened to those people for 16 years could happen today to someone for six years, 36 years, 76 years of blessing, what could be, has been withheld? Not that you died, but what could have been isn't. What did he say? He earns wages, does so to put them into a bag with holes. Where does it all go? How does this happen? Why is this? I came looking and it wasn't there. You, verse 9, you looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. God, what are you doing? Why, why would you do that? He wants you to consider your ways. Is it possible that we have paneled houses, ways, implying I'm good. I'm focused on me, taking care of me. This is great. This is good. I'm not so interested in that. The Lord stuff, the Lord's temple within. Um, I'm smiling right now, okay? I'm wondering what it might have been like to be a prophet to speak God's ways to God's people. Some of the prophets were killed. You silence yourself or we will silence you. I'm speaking the Lord. I'm speaking what the Lord got. And they killed the prophets rather than hear what had to be said and make the necessary understandings and adjustments and considerations So what should I consider? Well, let me just say, first of all, your temple. I'm talking to believers now. Those of you who have professed the work of Christ on the cross, have believed in him for the the forgiveness of your sins and the resurrection of the dead of Jesus himself. If you believe that, and I'm with Jesus, I am with Jesus. I've been baptized in the waters of baptism. I am a believer in Jesus. Okay, how is your temple building going? Consider your ways of building your temple. How much time or effort in building your relationship with God do you take to build that temple? How much time or effort in growing in the knowledge of the Word of God? Studying it, reading it, taking notes about it, meditating over it, 
praying over it. Lord, I read this passage in Corinthians, and I'm thinking maybe that was for me. Yeah, maybe it was. How much time do we spend in building our temple? What about your spiritual gifts? Christian, believer, you have one, at least one, maybe more, probably more. How are you using your spiritual gifts? Do you even know what the spiritual gifts are? Are you using them? Are you using them to build up the body of Christ here at PCC? I'm speaking to the members of PCC, but I'm also speaking to those who this is your church home, but you're not a member. I would encourage you to become a member. I really would. We could use you. God's church needs, I don't know what he has planned for us in the next five years. I think we're going to need some workers. He's been talking to me a little bit. I've been asking, Lord, what would you have for PCC? Well, okay then. We're going to have to get about building our temple and using our spiritual gifts for the cause of Christ. Are you using your spiritual gifts here to advance the cause of Christ? Could we please double the number of children's workers in this fellowship so that those who continually do it, do it, do it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it for the last six years could have more time here? They sacrifice so much. I'm so proud of them. I thank them every week, I hope. But consider that. And other things. How are your, consider your parenting philosophy and skills. Consider your grandparenting philosophy and skills. How are you doing with all that? Passing it on to the next generation. Boy, that's a, well, what a wonderful way to invest a life, to consider your ways and advance it. I'll be doing a parenting quick little seminar this, this summer. This is my plan for everybody. I don't have kids. They're out of the home. Are you a grandparent? Would you like to be a grandparent? I mean, many people would. Okay, let's talk about how are we going to do that for the next generation? I've got some ideas. How is your expression of adoration and praise to the great God of the universe? As I read from the psalmist today, his works are worthy to be praised. Do you go through the motions, or do you actually praise God when you come here to sing and to meditate and to fellowship and to just enjoy what we do here as a corporate body. How is your meditation, your worship, your adoration of God? Have you lately considered the greatness of your salvation? I mean, seriously. The scriptures speak of us being transferred from this kingdom to this kingdom. There's only two kingdoms, and we were here, and we were transferred here. Let me have that next verse from Colossians. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's our kingdom now. When was the last time you considered that change? How, I mean, oh, how can you not praise and worship God with a joyful heart when you consider what once was and what now is true? And that's true for us, believers, disciples of Christ. But let me also ask, in your consideration of many of your ways, how is your heart, your concern, and your actions for those who have not yet transferred? Some haven't transferred yet. What do you care? What are you doing? What are you offering? How does that affect you? Consider your ways as you relate to those who have not yet transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. I could do this all day, I think. I've got one more. I mean, how many ways do we have to consider? A lot. I know, I know. But consider your ways. Consider your passion to build your kingdom, your comfort, your ease, versus, or on the other side, God's kingdom in the hearts of men. Consider your ways. How's that going? You know this quote. Show me your calendar and I'll tell you your heart. Show me your calendar and I'll tell you your heart. I know what your priorities are. Show me your calendar. 
I got it. I know. It's it's cousin. Show me your checkbook, and I'll tell you your heart. I know what your priorities are. Clear as bell. On the front of your bulletin for six, going six and more years now, it has every week, for, for the most part, every week it has said the goals of this place, of this church, of this local fellowship. And I want you to consider your ways in relative to those three. What does it say? Our three goals are to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to love one another, and to live with an eternal perspective. And let me just summarize all of that I've said by consider your ways in regard to those three things. Let God speak to you, how it's going, what you're doing, how this, what about that. Verse verse 2, once again, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, The time has not yet come to work on their temple. And I'm going, oh, let's not not do that. Let's agree together as a congregation, the time has come. The time has come to work on our individual temples and then our corporate body together to the cause of Christ. The time has come. Let's get to the building of all of that. If there are some who are saying, I'm, if I consider my ways and I come to the conclusion that I'm not yet of Christ, I'm still, I think I might be over in this kingdom here still. Can I help? You want to come and talk? Let's chat. Let's, let's get an understanding about that. Let me help you understand as you honestly and faithfully consider your ways. I had the blessing just a couple weeks ago having a consider your ways conversation with a young man was glorious. He considered his ways, and he came to faith in Jesus Christ our Lord because he considered his ways. We should all be considering our ways. And if you need any help, I'd be pleased to help. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for the prophet Haggai, for your including it into your word, your Bible that we can enjoy today. It's a powerful consideration, a powerful word that you had for those people and for us as well. And I pray that you would, by your spirit, help us to consider our ways. Help us to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Whatever we can do, however we are called to be involved in that, that we might also love one another deeply from the heart And that we might live with an eternal perspective in all the choices that we make day after day, living with an eternal perspective, drawing people into the kingdom of your son. I pray you would use this church and these dear people to accomplish that. And we ask it for the glory of Christ. Amen. I'll see you next week.